Hi guys, welcome back. I am Red Z and welcome back to RAS Weekends. Today we have something extremely exciting for you. A very special interview with Mosca Flacker himself. Part-time mod developer, full-time troll. Like I said last time, repeating jokes already, but welcome to the channel, Mosca. Thanks, I'm excited to be here today, again. Again, yeah, I should have said again. <laughs> Welcome to the channel. And today we're going to be going through all the major gameplay changes for RAS version 0.6. So you really don't want to miss out on this one. We're going to be covering a lot, <laughs> aren't we, aren't yes, we, boss? This is, this is the interview that actually matters. Yeah. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> yes, very good. So uh, we're going to go through quite a lot of the changes today, especially the major changes to the gameplay. Uh, a lot of you guys have been asking that. You've all been saying the map looks fantastic. But yes, we want to know about the gameplay changes. So first of all, let's talk about that map. Because that is the elephant in the room, right? <laughs> so uh, do you want to just give us your version of why the map works so well, being so big? And maybe a response to some of the people that are concerned about the size of the map. Um, so... The thing that's really cool about the big map is the fact that um, there's always a bigger fish, basically, and it lets it lets you as a player develop your own big, mighty empire. But at the same time, across the world, there is um, other factions building up and getting really strong. Um, so. Just because you're the biggest faction on the map doesn't mean that everyone else is weak and is not and you're and is not a threat to you. Um, so that's one thing that we really like about the big map. Um, the other thing is having a bigger map lets you have a more strategic approach to your city management and kind of uh, your your city warfare management. So. Since there's so many cities on the map, it's not as big of a deal to lose one city or two cities in the strategic big picture because it will let you, like, you can afford to lose a couple cities in one place, but you're still fine um, and it's not going to be a game over situation. Whereas on other smaller maps, once you lose a couple, if you lose a couple cities, you're going to be in big trouble. Here, you can say, oh, well, I'll let them take a couple cities up to this point and then fall back and, you know, um, regroup somewhere where it's more convenient and it just feels like with the bigger map you have a lot more strategic options yeah definitely i think um you know you're definitely a lot deeper in terms of the campaign gameplay it takes a lot longer to take places and you've got a lot more threats um but what would you say to those people then that they think 1700 regions is too many too many regions which we see a lot we see we do see that a lot don't we so what would you say to those guys um it is a lot of regions but the world is a big place <laughs> and in the ris team uh we've always wanted to try and prioritize making a game that's fun and challenging but is also really historically accurate um, and the fact of the matter is, when you look at a map like Vanilla Rome Total War, or Rome 2, for example, they have, like, they'll have, Italy will be, like, five or six cities, yeah. like, Rome, Naples, Tarentum, Brundisium, uh, Aredium, and, like, that's Italy. Yeah. <laughs> In real life... The, when the Roman Republic had taken over the Italian peninsula, that alone basically made it a world superpower because Italy had so many cities and tribes and people living in there that it just, to have less cities just doesn't do the, the density of the ancient world justice. Yeah. Um, so... We just really want the map to be huge. Yep, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> um, just so you guys know, in the background, uh, you can see there's a big battle going on. We're just playing an AI battle, Battle Royale, and I know you can't see this Mosca, but it's absolute 
carnage already. The Antigonids, Egyptians, and Indo-Greeks have all decided to meet all at the same place, and they're all fighting each other, which is quite fun. Um, but yeah, in response to the large map, I've got to say, you know, if you're starting as a small nation, say, for example, you're starting as Epirus, um, then taking 100 regions, which is what you would do in a vanilla world conquest, is... It's just the same amount of sieges. I don't understand the, you know, you've just got to change your mindset slightly. People see 1,700 regions and think, oh, I'm going to have to do 1,700 sieges. Yes, you will do if you, have, if you want to do a world conquest, but you're not going to want to do a world conquest unless, you know, there's a few people that will, but most people probably won't want to do a world conquest. Uh, they'll want to do something slightly different uh, and take a few different regions themselves. Uh, rather than a world conquest and take like Greece for example rather than uh, the whole empire or the whole world I mean taking Rome now is really actually uh, making the, Re uh, the Roman Empire is actually really quite a big challenge now and a big uh, time consuming thing as well which it should do you shouldn't be able to take make a world conquest in like 50 turns um, so that's what I think anyway I think you're going to do the same amount of sieges as you would in vanilla it's just going to you know, you're not going to take as much land <laughs> as you would in vanilla in terms of the land. So, yeah. I want to add one more thing to the idea of world conquest. I think for people who want to take over the world, more cities is better because it gives you more more content to play with. Um, and as well as that, no one no one is going to make you take over the world. That's that's your own decision. If you if you're someone who likes to take over the whole map then I would assume that more cities would be more enjoyable for you. If you're someone who doesn't want to take over the whole map, then honestly, this is going to be a more realistic experience for you because it's going to show you or it's going to simulate just trying to make your local dominance um, and that's going to feel more deeper and more rewarding. Yeah, definitely. I think I completely agree with that. And like I say, you know, uh, if you take 100, 100 cities, that might be all of Greece and, say, maybe a bit of Anatolia. That's plenty of campaign enough. You've just got to make your own objectives and, you know, work on doing that before looking outside and thinking, oh, it's going to be so many sieges. Because, yeah, you start with Epirus, like five settlements. To get 100 settlements, you're going to have to do the same amount as vanilla. And that's a big empire on this game. So, honestly, the, you know, the siege fest thing, I think, is very much a red herring. Um, from my perspective, from my play as well, from playing the game, um, of course. Uh, but yeah, one of the... Should we move on from the map there? Yeah. Have we said everything we want to? Yes. Yeah, cool. Well, next to that though, guys, one of the big changes for RAS in the new uh, update in version 0 0.6 is the four turns per year. So do you want to just go over why you've decided to make it four turns per Per year uh, and any of the changes that that's brought as well with that um so four turns per year is kind of funny because honestly in my opinion it doesn't really change that much on its own <laughs> but four turns per year with other factors can make things a lot more interesting um people always say that they want four turns per year because it lets them grow their characters more, but I think in two turns per year it happens just fine. Um, we decided to do four turns per year because, for one, it lets us have more happen per year, so um, it doesn't feel like characters age as quickly. Um, but as well as that, we also reduced the... Um, the speed that characters grow their traits because in RIS 0.5 you can get a character to have a lot of traits and a lot of stats really fast hmm. because and the reason for that is partially because it's only two turns per year now that it's four turns per year we've slowed down the growth of characters in terms of their stats while um, also adding in a whole lot more traits that um, add flavor and um, interesting gameplay dynamics. Um, but I don't think that four turns per year on its own actually changes anything, but four turns per year with everything else that we've added is going to feel a lot more fun, 
and I know it's a popular request. Um, so now we have it. Yeah, fantastic. And mixed in with that, you have changed recruitment times as well. So do you want to just go through that and why you decided to change recruitment times as the Indo-Greeks and the Ptolemies are now absolutely tearing bits of each other? <laughs> so uh, in RIS 0.5, um, the current public uh, version, um, units take one turn to recruit, um, agents take one turn to re recruit, boats take one turn to recruit. Um, for 0 0.6, we decided to go with two turns recruitment for units, which means that every single unit will take two turns to recruit, well, all military units like um, yeah. soldiers and boats are going to take two turns to recruit. Um, part of that is because we went with four turns per year. So, personally, me and a couple other people felt like you wouldn't really be able to grow a whole army of, like, hoplites or, or like, good troops at one turn per year. Like, as in, um, one turn per year would be three months. Yeah. So we felt like it wasn't really, um, like, a good time scale that you could just get that many troops per year. You could get, essentially, a new unit every three months. Whereas before it was one unit every six months. Um, as well as that, I personally, a pet peeve of mine in Rome Total War and Total War games in general, is buildings and units that take one turn to recruit. Because what you can do is, you can leave your city completely empty with bad public order, mm. build a one turn building like a temple, recruit a one turn unit like a javelin guy or a or a militia unit or whatever, and then leave the city completely undefended with bad public order, and then over the next turn you just you just have good public order because over that turn you got your your unit and your building. So in 0 0.6, I'm proud to say that no buildings take one turn to build, so you can't just leave your city with bad public order <laughs> and leave it and not worry about it and build something and you're fine. You, you're going to have to do a little bit more planning, and it's the same idea with the unit. As well as that, um, two turns recruitment, we feel, also helps reduce the spamminess of armies. Yeah. So you grow your army slower, but so does the AI. Um, so defeating a big army is going to be more impactful. Losing a unit is going to be more impactful. And keeping your army intact is going to be more important. Yeah, cool. So I think uh, I quite like the one turn thing, but that's because I like to blitz. So... <laughs> <laughs> but no, I completely agree with the two turn, uh, the two turn thing. Um, I think it makes the game a lot more tactical. Uh, you know, like you say, everything just has a bit more of an impact, doesn't it? So it's uh, it's enjoyable to play, definitely. Um, but yeah, so uh, is that everything you want to say about four turns per year then, or anything else on that? Um, yeah, yeah, cool. So on to the economy then. The economy has been completely overhauled, right? So do you want to just take us through some of the reasons for that and then also some of the major changes we're going to see in 0.6? Right. So in 0 0.5, we were using a... Um, the base of our economy came from an old mod from Rome Total War called Extended Realism. Mm. And... This mod kind of um, was seen in old Rome Total War modding as kind of like the best um, economic balance that you could have in a mod. So yeah. a lot of other mods would use their system. And the idea of extended realism was that, first of all, uh, agriculture is the most important source of money in an ancient empire, which is true. Uh, yeah. And you earn more money later through trade, but at the start, um, your most important sort of source of money is farming. Mm. And then, as well as that, we um, so we we basically just had extended realism's economy in RIS. Um, yeah. Now our unit costs were a lot higher though, and that was because we wanted mili uh, military units to feel really important. And also because um, 
it, it helps slow down the player from being able to grow a giant army and then blitz everything on the map. Yeah. So, so we think high unit upkeep is really important. Have you got the as well as that? Um, for zero point six, we have kind of changed a whole lot. Um, for zero point five, you only had three levels of fertility available per city, which means that any city, the most fertility it could have is three, and the least fertility it could have is one. Um, and fertility basically determines how much money a city or region can get from its farms. Um, mm. In 0 0.6, we now have 14 levels of fertility, which is the amount of fertility used in vanilla. So the most barren region only has one fertility, yeah. and the most fertile region has 14 fertility. Um, so there's a whole lot more variation in how much money you can get per city. The the most poorest region is now is equal to the most poorest region in 0 0.5, but the most wealthiest region in 0 0.6 is worth a lot more than the most wealthiest region in 0 0.5. Yeah. So quite because quite a lot of people do struggle with the economy, especially at the start. Uh, and expansion is always your friend, guys. So always remember that. Even on 0 0.6, even though the economy's probably going to be a bit stronger the later you go into the game. But early game, you're still going to need to heavily expand. Try and get as as much as many cities under your belt as possible with your starting army, um, which is kind of cool. Um, on top yeah. of that, you have removed the elite tax building as well, I believe. Um, yeah. And why, why is that then? And why have you removed that building? Because I, I do see... A, quite often on the discord a lot of people using it i personally don't use it in my campaigns um but i have seen a lot of people use it on the discord so why did you decide then to get rid of that bad boy so we stuck the elite tax in to 0 0.5 at the last minute because we had a couple complaints that you didn't have enough money uh personally i didn't think we needed it hmm. um and i thought we were fine without it but it was just a little bit of extra money that a player can get if they're struggling. Um, it's It's been taken out because we've been able to kind of fine-tune the economy a little bit better now. Um, but it's, it's not going to be in 0 0.6. Yeah. And of course, like, more regions just equals more cash in general, doesn't it? Which... Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's lots more regions on the map, guys. I mean, there's pretty much nearly double the amount of regions. So mm -hmm. there should be, you know, nearly double the amount of cash going around. So you, you won't need it in 0 0.6 is what we're trying to say. Um, no. unless, unless you are Mosca, of course, who uh, who's going to mod it back into the game so he can use it himself. Yeah, just for me personally. <laughs> just for you. The Mosca, the 0 0.6 Mosca edition. <laughs> With 20 turns per year and uh, five elite tax buildings per uh, per city. Per city. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, along with that, there are quite a few other changes. Like um, the mines are now split into gold and silver, which if you've played Divide and Conquer, you will have seen that in that mod as well. Um, so yeah, mines are split into gold and silver now. Um, trade is reworked to complement farming more. Do you, do you know any more on that? That's all the detail I've got. So uh, what, uh, what's um, the, what different about trade then? To put it simply, the trade percentage values that you get from buildings has been adjusted. And as well as that, in 0 0.5, there was a whole lot of like plus 10% trade, minus 3% tax, mm. plus 20% trade, minus 10% tax, stuff like that which is kind of unintuitive and confusing. That's a holdover from the old um, Extended Realism mod economic system. Um, we decided that we don't need that. So it's just it's going to be a little bit more straightforward being able to calculate how much money a building is going to give you. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's cool. Um, and if you're, if you're struggling with that, guys, you can just open the building, the settlement details tab and the economy tab and you can see exactly how much money you're going to be making so do make sure you do check that out when you are trying to campaign manage in games um can we just yes, that's like, very helpful 
Yeah, can we just slide back slightly to the building costs then? So the building costs sure. have been changed then? Is Have they been increased, reduced? Um, or is it just, you know, a case-by-case -case basis when you when you were changing these to see, you know... Some buildings cost more, some buildings cost less. For example, the trader, I always felt like is kind of a building that doesn't give much for its investment, so mm. the trader's a little bit cheaper. Um, the, um, the sewers are a little bit more expensive because the sewers are, um, really good. Yep. Um... If you're not, if you don't, if you don't know much about Rome Total War, the most important um, stat a building can give is population growth. Yeah. So we wanted to put a really high extra price tag on anything that can be a pop growth building. Your farms are going to cost roughly the same as they did in 0 0.5, but buildings that give extra free pop growth or pop growth and happiness are going to cost more because the key to advancing your economy in Rome Total War is population growth. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That makes sense. And uh, roads as well. I How how are the roads looking in terms of the cost? Roads cost more. Yeah. I believe. I thought, and they also take longer to build. Yeah, I thought they would do. Um, because I think it was one turn previously, wasn't it? One turn for the basic yeah. level roads. Um, the vanilla cost is one, one turn in a thousand, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, cool. So, quite a lot of changes to the economy there, guys, as you can see. Uh, and we'll just slide it back slightly as well. And combined with that, like we said, the unit upkeep has been changed. How, do you know how much it's been changed by? Or was that, again, a case-by-case -case basis per, for each um, sort of tier of unit? A little bit of both. Um, I believe in 0 0.5, our something that was called the global upkeep modifier, which is basically just a number that all of the unit's costs gets multiplied by because... Yeah. Okay, to like, unit unit, unit stats in RIS are a doozy because we use this thing called um, the Ediumatic, which is basically an automated Excel spreadsheet yeah. that calculates unit costs and unit stats um, using a bunch of like complex formulas hmm. so it can be a little bit hard to explain to someone who's not familiar with it yeah. and in ris it's never as simple as saying oh just make this unit cost less or oh just <laughs> make this unit have better stats because there are a whole lot of um hidden buttons and levers and interconnected things that yeah. when you change one thing it can change a lot of things so unit stat balance is always tricky, but I think overall our unit stat balance is good. But anyway, going back to the cost, I want to say that in 0 0.5, our unit upkeep modifier was 1. Point, uh, 1. 1.15, hmm. I think. And now in uh, 0 0.6, it's more like... 1.22 um and like with like the context that i can tell you like that isn't like that's hard to wrap your mind around but <laughs> let's just say yes units are a little bit more expensive but there's also a whole lot more money floating around in general yeah i think that's the the main takeaway really isn't it like uh, although some things have become more expensive in general just with more settlements they're just more money like so <laughs> They have to had to have become more expensive. Otherwise, it would just be you'd be flush with money all the time, and it wouldn't yeah. be a challenge economy-wise. And if you know me, and guys, you know that I love an economic challenge and a campaign management challenge, uh, even more so than a battle challenge. So, uh, yeah, it's good to keep that that extra challenge there as well. Yeah. Um, I I strongly believe that. Um, the, for the oh, the way for a total war game to be good is for it to be hard because I've talked to so many people over the years who say oh yeah total war I like that they have the city management and the battle management it's cool mm. but it's always too easy for me and I get bored of it so I stop playing yeah and that is true for myself and a lot of people who I've spoken with so I really want the game to be challenging, especially for people like that who say, oh, Total War, that game's too easy, I don't play it anymore, so people can see, 
yes, this game can be challenging. Yeah. Yes, this game can be fun to, to beat. And it's not just grow a big army and then auto resolve the whole map. Yeah. Um, as well as that, I I want the game to be difficult. And when I see, for example, feedback that says this game is too hard, um, don't don't get mad at me. I'm sorry, but to <laughs> me that means that we're doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, difficulty wise, it's always been a game that has, um, you know. Well, sorry, a mod that you're trying to challenge. Obviously, Rome Total War itself is ridiculously easy on vanilla. Uh, but yeah, I do I do agree with that difficulty thing, to be fair, because when I think about the, you know, the Total War games I've played the most of, uh, you know, well, the, all the mods I've played the most of, it's often the ones that have offered extra depth uh, and extra challenge. So uh, yeah, uh, I do really agree with that. Uh, I love a bit of a challenge, especially when it comes to campaign management. Um, so I think that's cool. I think that's really good. Um, but combined with that, so you've changed the the unit upkeep as well. We have had a video on it, but do you want to just briefly go over the unit stat changes and why there's quite a bit of variation now in some of the stats uh, as we see across different rosters? Yeah, so the biggest change now is... Broadly speaking, unit stats and unit unit mechanics and battles are going to be broadly the same as they were in 0 0.5. Uh, so there's no like big changes to any individual unit or any type of unit. Yeah. But in 0 0.5, most unit stats are big copy pastes of each other. In yeah. 0 0.6, we've taken more time to individualize units to have. Um, slightly more unique stats without making them like crazy different from each other because for example uh you can say oh well the greek hoplites or sorry the athenian hoplites and the spartan hoplites um how much different how different should they be from each other how much stronger should one be than the other and it's like okay well maybe spartan hoplites would be a little bit better but at the end of the day they're both just guys wearing armor and carrying spears so like <laughs> yeah. To say, like, that they need to have, like, crazy different stats is also, like, maybe overkill. Mm. Um, but we did want we did want to emphasize differences in, in unit stats for units that are different. Yeah. Um, so the way that we tried to achieve that was by using um, function or um, settings in the, the EDU of Rome Total War, which the EDU is the abbreviation for export desk or units, which is the, the text file where all of the unit stats live. So if you want to change a unit stat, a unit stat, you use the EDU. Yeah. But like I said, we use this other big Excel spreadsheet called the EDU Matic, which basically generates your your EDU for you using a whole bunch of formulas that you plug into it. We there in the EDU there are two separate mechanics one is called um dwelling and one is called culture yeah dwelling is basically the kind of like the environment where the unit lives or comes from and culture is like the style of unit or the uh, cultural background of the unit yeah so we've um added a whole bunch of different um cultures and dwellings that didn't previously exist in the edu and then used those to um apply to different units to just try and make units have some more subtle differences. Yeah, and uh, I did do a video on this last week, guys, so do check that video out if you want more detail on it. But uh, as uh, Mosk has just said, it, it, it's pretty much just changes based on the dwelling, where they come from, and uh, the culture as well, and then uh, different tiers of, tiers of units as well. Basically, how professional or how good and well-known those units were for being you know, a good army unit. You know, you've got your levy units, the ones that are, are trashed here, the people that just have been dragged off the streets to fight for the country. We call them Siloy in RIS. Yeah, Siloy, exactly. <laughs> or the Helots, I guess, as well. Um, Helots and Siloy are basically the same thing. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah. And uh, Mosloth's yeah. going to be mad at me for saying that. <laughs> so yeah you've got the uh the helots siloy same thing uh Malzos, please comment down below saying that they're not <laughs> then you've got standard you've got professional which is a more professional troop 
And then fourth tier, you've got a more, uh, I think, that's elite oh, troop, elite. isn't it? Yeah. And yes. then we've got fifth tier, which is veteran. And, and there's actually a really, there's a funny story about um, elite is the fourth tier and veteran is the top tier, the highest tier. Yeah. Um, and for a long time, um, Hal was irritated that veteran was higher than elite. And he was like, oh, elite should be better than, than veteran. And I was like, no, veteran should be better. It's fine. <laughs> Um, and this was something that we were arguing about for literally months. Like every time he would see that veteran was better than elite, he would get, we would, we would argue about it. <laughs> and one day we were arguing about it and I said, okay, think about it like this. Elite guys are the guys who stand around in the palace and have fancy armor. And veterans are the guys who fought in 6 billion wars yeah. and have been around since, you know, the elite guys were in diapers and have won a whole bunch of battles. And that's why veterans are better than elite. And he was like, okay, fine. And I finally <laughs> won that argument. Yeah. But that was something that we argued about literally for months. Um, and we finally agreed that veteran would be better than elite. And <laughs> all it comes down to is which one is better, elite or veteran. Um, and yeah. we decided that it would be elite. Veteran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice no no it sounds good um and there are changes to the generals as well the general units are smaller and you can yep. thank yours truly for that do you want to just tell this story Moscow, or, or not um basically there's an episode of the the lucid campaign that uh red Z is doing where he 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 was playing as the lucid empire and he got attacked by a whole bunch of Egyptian units and he saw a big Egyptian army coming at him and he went to his cities and got about six or seven um, units of generals bodyguards <laughs> and used that army to defeat the big Egyptian invasion and when Hal saw that he was <laughs> livid he was foaming at the mouth he was furious and he said you shouldn't be able to do that um, so we reduced the size of the general's bodyguard, so you now have less general's bodyguards per unit, and um, yeah, hopefully general stacking is not as big of a as big of a um, a thing a thing in uh, zero point six. Which yeah. I I I personally see both sides of it. Like I can see why <laughs> general stacking is fun, but. It's also kind of annoying that you can just have this really good unit basically for free that yeah. also auto-replenishes, and as long as the general of the unit doesn't die, then they just are basically invincible. Yeah. Um, so I actually like it better how it is now, but I also, at the start, I was arguing with I was like, no, it's fine, just don't worry about it. Like, if people want a general <laughs> stack, they're going to general stack. But in the end, I think he was right. Um, yeah. And that's normal. He... Hal knows what he's talking about. He's a really good modder. He's a yeah. smart guy. Uh, I, I agree, I think, um, obviously, with both points there. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, uh, so, sorry, guys. Yeah, it's my fault that the General's bodyguards have been reduced in size. Um, so, I do apologize for that if you like the general stack. But, I mean, I did it. <laughs> And I apologize to you all for that. But yes, uh, you got to do what you got to do, haven't you? you got to do what you got to do. That's that's all I'm going to say about that one. Um, but yeah, so here we are loaded into another battle, guys. Another tasty little uh, venture between a few of the Thracian and Greek factions once again. Uh, but let's talk a little bit then about population growth. So what have you changed with the population growth? And um, why does it make a big difference on the map? mate um so with population growth the a big function of how fast the population grows comes from the fertility level like i mentioned previously yeah so there's going to be some regions that are going to grow their population pretty fast because they have really high fertility some regions it's going to be quite a bit slower um We've also put in some effects on the government building, the uh, like the governor's villa type building, yeah. which has built in minus population growth 
to okay. kind of counteract the huge extra population growth that you get um, from um, the extra, the extra, excuse me, the extra fertility, as well as increasing um, the amount, or sorry, decreasing the amount of population needed to gain a squalor level. Yeah. The squalor is basically um, a little penalty to happiness and population growth per number of people in the city. I think right now it's every 1,200 people in the city gives one point of squalor. Yeah. Um, so that is roughly a quick summary of that. Yeah, cool. So a, a bit of a change to the squalor and the population growth. So, but what about those like small, um, low fertility regions? Will you still be able to get them up to huge city, or is it almost impossible now? I guess. Um, I don't know about impossible, but it's definitely going to be harder. Um, but cities with one pop or with one fertility are going to be pretty rare and pretty out of the way. Think cities like in the Sahara Desert yeah. and in the Russian steppes, like or the Alps or something it, like that. Yeah, cities that are one population growth are gonna be like you really shouldn't care about those cities because like they're basically worthless. It's more like holding <laughs> a city with one population or with one fertility. It's more about just planting your flag somewhere and saying like, "Oh, I own this," rather than actually like being like oh, I need this to make money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fair enough. So everyone that's watching now can see my massive grin on my face because <laughs> the full stack of Thinoid Clubmen are engaged in combat, boys. They are here. Yes. Here come the boys. <laughs> here come the boys. The dudes. The dudes. The dudes. Here they come. Here they come. Fighting Thracian Noble Cavalry. I'm not going to lie. That's probably not going to go well for you, Clubmen. Uh, but there's just a horde of them just charging over the map. This is fantastic. This is great to see. I hope they win out, but I doubt it. Um, but linked to that then, of course, more squalor means probably public order is a little bit harder to manage. And linked in with that, of course, um, in the previous, in 0.5, you've got that massive religious and cultural unrest every now and then that just pops up out of nowhere when you, uh, you, know, when you have a city that doesn't have your native culture. So has that changed at all? And, you know, how is the public order management system compared to 0.5? Yeah. So what you're talking about is in the game mechanics, it's called religion. We call it culture in the game because we're basically using the religion mechanic from Barbarian Invasion yeah. to simulate culture and cultural differences. So you can have, like, a city that's like, I don't know, 50% Greek and 50% Roman. Yeah. And technically in 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 the context of the game, the the word that you're that you're that you're referring to is called religion, but yeah, it it's we call it culture in RIS because we're trying to culture, we're sorry, we're trying to simulate cultural differences. Yeah. In RIS 0.6, we've actually added a whole bunch of separate Greek religions so basically in 0 0.5 you had three main types of greek you had western hellenic eastern hellenic yeah. and um greek now in 0 0.6 we've added a whole bunch of different greek sub religions including dorian ionian aeolian um Epirote, macedonian and mm. and even more but yeah. those are just the ones that i can remember off the top of my head um, so that means that if you're, for example, an Aeolian faction and you take a region from a, uh, Dorian faction, yeah. you're going to have to deal with a little bit of public order penalty because you're technically a different culture. So when you take over Greece, it's going to be a little bit harder to manage it because there's so many different kinds of Greeks. And this is something that is based on real history is that. The Greeks were very independent-minded people yeah. and did not like being taken over. It, that's why it was such an achievement, for example, when the Macedonians were able to get hegemony over most of Greece. It's because 
it was pretty hard to do that because the Greeks did not like being under people. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, like the history of that region, like at the time, is just backstabbing and hatred <laughs> and rivalries. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um. Yeah. So it, it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's really cool adding those extra cultures in as well. Uh, a lot more depth into the Greeks, doesn't it? So, uh, mm -hmm. it is cool. Um. But yeah. So does so that. Uh, so linked with that then, that big cultural unrest sort of wave that you have, have every now and then, that's that's been slightly reduced, am I right? Or is that still there? Um, it's still there, but it has been reduced, yes. Yeah. Which I think is good, because like, you'll get a city nice and happy, and then every now and then it'll just go crazily angry, which uh, is fine. But yeah, it does. It does shock you every now and then. Comes out of nowhere, so I think it's a good. Uh, I think it's good that that's reduced. But the public order management side, where you can directly manage it, is a bit more um, involved, should we say? Or, or you know, there's a bit more you can do with that, and a bit more uh, sort of difference in there as well. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. But moving on, as we look at some of your favorite units, Mosca, the uh, Tenian Hoplites, fighting uh, some uh, Scythe Chariots. Not doing amazingly, but... <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's going to be kept in, bro. That's going to be kept in. Oh, yeah. That was me. <laughs> uh, so let's talk a little bit about the starting position changes. Um, so what is the difference now when we go on to 0 0.6? What is the difference when you load up the game, you're, you're loading up your favorite faction, which of course is the Kimbri because it's you. Um, what is the difference uh -huh. now to, <laughs> to, how, uh, to how it starts, how the game starts for you? Man, it's been it's been so long since we worked on this stuff that yeah. it can be hard to keep track of it in my head. But basically, you should be starting off with a small garrison in all of your cities and a primary army that is strong enough to take over a couple neighboring cities. And you might be in debt, you might not be, depending on what faction. Yeah. And you just got to take the army that you have and go out and go take over land. Um, so it's it's going to be pretty similar to 0 0.5, I think, but it's it's going to be different. Um, the 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 main way to make make money in 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 is still going to be conquest. Yeah. But you're going to have a little bit more easy access to money in 0 0.6. Um, yeah. And I think you're going to. Some factions start off with bigger armies, some start off with smaller. It really depends on which faction. But mm. if you start off with a smaller army, you're going to have more money available to you, more likely. Yeah. But it also depends on how we felt that faction, the, the strength that we felt that faction had historically. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah, everywhere now kind of gets a really good-sized army, don't they? Well, most... Well, we, we can't say everywhere. We can't Melia does not start with a good army. Who does it? Oh, Massalia. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, that's Massalia. Nice stock, <laughs> Fuck Massalia, bro. <laughs> yes. Loads of people love Massalia, though, so I can't say that. I'm sorry, Massalia bros. Oh, I say it. Fuck Massalia. <laughs> that's uh, the rallying cry for me and Mosca these days. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, fuck Massalia. Uh, but no. In all seriousness, yeah, most most nations will get a good uh, will get a good sized army, so you should shouldn't have too much problem going out and conquering straight away. Uh, and of course, that is the meta of RAS, and it will be the meta for 0 0.6, like we've yeah. said. Um, but yeah, there's a few new sort of size cities at the start of the game, isn't there? I believe like Alexandria is a large city now, and Seleucia might be as well. Uh, but I could be wrong on Seleucia, but. I'm sure Alexandria is now a large city starting. Uh, and there's a few other like minor cities, like I think Antioch's a minor city. Is Athens maybe a minor city? I can't remember, but there is a few places that have been increased in size right from the, right from the start of the game. Um, yes. There are. Uh, 
I'm, I'm not going to be able to tell, sit here and tell you this city is now this size and it used to be that size. I can't tell you that for like as a fact. Yeah. But I can I can assure you that yes, certain cities are bigger than they were before. But I can't tell, I don't know specifically which. Yeah, so I think that's just going to add a bit of extra tactics if you're playing in those regions. You know, do you go for the weaker garrison, smaller city, or do you really go all all out guns? blazing for say a larger city with a bit more resources a bit more money and better recruitment facilities so yeah and it makes sense because these cities in 270 bc were you know for the time anyway large cities shall we say uh yeah, rather large than cities and developed cities with a lot of resources and infrastructure um, yeah exactly we um i mean for example if you're playing as greece in sorry if you're playing in greece you're really going to want to try and take over Athens as soon as possible because it's worth so much money. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like, there's... Um, and and when you're, when you're looking at the campaign map, pay attention. Like, oh, is this city a minor city? Is this city a town? Is this city, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. that, that is really important information, and it should be... Um, a big factor in what cities you decide to attack and what cities you decide to ignore. Yeah. And of course, always look on the map, guys, for what resources the city might have as well. Um, if you look directly for the trade resources, you can see which cities, you know, might have a, a mine available to build, might already have a mine there as well, or which cities have really good trade resources that are going to make more trade. Uh, if you really want to get that min maxi with it, which, you know, Get in maxi. Always like to do that. So, yeah, do check those trade resources on the map because most people just ignore them and don't think that they're a thing. But, yeah, check those out and you'll be able to see which cities will give you a lot of good trade uh, in the area. Um, so, along with that, I believe that there's a few other little things. So, spies, diplomats, and watchtowers are placed strategically to help get the ball rolling. Um, so, is there a few more watchtowers there at the start of the game? We got Elven Vision, we got uh, Legolas. Let your elf eyes uh, tell me what your elf eyes see right from the start of the game, or or is that just for a select few factions? Um, a couple of factions that start with like either regions that are really really big, hmm. um, or that have um, like big gaps of vision in their land. We placed a couple uh, watchtowers just around the map so that it's easier to see. Yeah. Um. I w I was very careful with placing the watchtowers because I don't want the watchtowers to reveal like where a nearby city is, but it does let you see better inside your own land. Yeah. If that makes sense. When when watchtowers ten gold coins, bro. Um. Never. <laughs> We've we've had this argument a long time, guys. So uh, <laughs> yes. this is just the continuation of it. I want ten gold watchtowers. Moscow wants thousand five hundred gold watchtowers, or maybe two thousand. I, I can't remember. Well, but it's definitely yes. a lot more than ten. <laughs> um, yes. So yeah, ten gold watch gold watchtowers. Su su Red Z sub mod coming soon, bros. Uh, just uh, just keep keep a lookout. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I don't know how to mod. Uh, oh, that's really easy to change if you wanted to. No, yeah. No, I'm, I'm joking. I think they're still like a thousand or something, aren't they? So, yeah. which is fine. I don't, think they, I don't think their price has been changed, but I'm not sure. Yeah, and, and in terms of, obviously, we've got loads more factions, haven't we? Which we've seen a lot of. We've seen a lot of those new Greek, Thracian, Anatolian factions. So, I'm assuming with that, you've made sure that every faction has some diplomatic relations right at the start of the game as well whether it's a friend or a foe uh, or even just a trade partner yeah um we tried to keep the uh historic um alliances that existed um of course it's it can be you know it's hard to know for sure how things were but if we know yeah. like oh well these two had signed a, a agreement or something then we try to reflect that in the start positions but i I can't really speak to the 100% historical accuracy of that. Yeah, of course. And, and we, did, we did pay attention to it. And if you're playing on very hard, guys, we know how long the AI is going to uh, going to honor yes. those treaties. 
Uh, but yeah, no, that is good to see, though, that you actually, you know, most nations do start with a few allies or enemies just so that you've got a few directions you might want to expand in and uh, a few different things uh, with that tactically as well. Uh, but next to that, of course, uh, so the fog of war. A lot of people do complain about it being dark, but do you want to explain why you've kept it so dark then for 0.6? Um, we like how it looks. It adds kind of like a level of like mysteriousness and um, what do you call it? Like, uh, like makes the world feel like. Like, you don't know what's out there. Um, so we like it. Um, yeah. If you... you it, it is actually pretty easy to adjust that in the... Um, in the mod files, if you know how to do it. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to sit here and, like, explain how to do it, though. Because, like... There's, <laughs> it's, it's not, like, something that, like, I can verbalize. But, like, you'd have to, like, open it up and yeah. change some numbers. But we like how it is. Um, and as well as that... Once you know, like, where a city is, it doesn't matter if the Fog of War is dark, because you're just like, oh, I know it's over here, so I'm just going to walk in that way. Yeah. And also, it makes watchtowers and spies more valuable, which yeah. helps justify their extortionate price. <laughs> and you can also, like, if, you know, you, you don't want to go through that process of re recruiting spies to find the city in the wilderness, just toggle Fog of War for five minutes, find it, send your guy there toggle it back off i mean simple right <laughs> i know some people that. won't want to do that but uh, yeah you, you can do that you know you it's, want. it's not a problem if you are struggling to find somewhere just stick it on um but yeah do you know what would do you know what would really help with that as well mosca what is that 10 gold watchtowers bro yeah dude 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 watchtowers. <laughs> dude watchtowers dude. exactly 10 gold watchtowers <laughs> maybe one day we'll see one day one day so i'll take that as a yes <laughs> so uh we are back with another battle guys and first things first i want to ask you moscow why have you deleted the antigonid roster uh huh 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 don't, don't put that in, dude. Don't put that in. That's just going straight in, bro. Don't put that in, dude. <laughs> it's going straight in. Right, let's talk about um, personalities. Um, personalities of... Are we talking about personalities of units there? Of uh, Sorry, of governors? It's AI factions. Okay, like, yeah, let's talk about AI then. So what changes have you made to the AI then with 0.6? Okay. So, first of all, I want to start off by saying that modding AI and programming AI is a really hard thing. Um, like, yeah. especially when we're talking about an AI from a game that was made in, like, 2005. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that you just can do and can't do. And like you started saying, which is something that you actually got from me, is... AI gonna AI. Sometimes the AI is gonna make decisions that to us as humans make no sense, but for some reason or another, the AI has decided that that is the best decision to make, and the AI is gonna AI and do it. Yeah. Um. Um. For now, the biggest change to the AI, I think, is um. There's a file in the mod folder called, or in Rome Total War. Um, called, um, it's called, like, Desker AI Personalities or something like that. Yeah. And what this file has is a bunch of values you can set for what kind of units the AI is going to want to recruit and what kind of buildings the AI is going to want to build, as well as some hints for its decision making. Mm. So this is, for example, there's an AI personality called Genghis, which prioritizes horse archers and light cavalry yeah. and you give that one to you know horse archer factions <laughs> there's one called caesar which prioritizes swordsmen and heavy infantry you give that to the romans and factions that use a lot of swordsmen yeah um stuff like that anyway so um 
one of the values that you can set for each personality is called the the risk taker AI risk taker or something like that. Hmm. And what this uh, setting means is basically how many units does the AI think it needs to successfully attack another um, target. Yeah. So if the AI target or AI aggression or sorry, I'm sorry, AI risk taker is one, then that means that the AI is going to think that it only needs half as many units as its target to attack, yeah. which is not desirable because it basically means that you're going to get attacked by a bunch of little armies that are easy to beat. Yeah. Um, in RIS 0 0.5, we set the AI risk taker for, I want to say, all factions to, f to two. Mm -hmm. And two means that the AI thinks it needs equal numbers of troops to successfully attack a target in order to win a battle. Yeah. Um, for RIS.6, we've changed that to three for all factions and four for the um, kind of like main villain big bad guy factions like yeah. Rome, Egypt, Carthage, and the Seleucid Empire. Um, so for those guys, it's four. For everyone else, it's three. Yeah. Uh, what three means is basically that the AI is going to try and get um, as many men plus half as many men. So, in other words, 150% more troops before it attacks a target. And with Risk Taker 4, it means that the AI wants to tr attack with double the amount of troops that its target has. Yeah. And from our testing... We've seen that this helps make the AI more aggressive because they're more willing to take a big stack of units and attack like a weekly garrison city. And when you have 1,700 cities, there's a whole lot of cities that don't have big garrisons. Yeah. So this is a change that we made that I'm personally pretty excited for, and I think it's worked out pretty well. Um, and hopefully other people enjoy this change as well. Yeah, cool. And... Uh... There's a little mode as well that helps out with that, right? Uh, can we speak on that now, or <laughs> is that uh, is that something we can't speak about? RIS 0.6 has added a, a little script at the start of the campaign called Extreme Mode. And basically, when you start up your campaign, it says, Do you want to play on Extreme Mode? Yes or no? And Extreme Mode basically gives the AI more money than it... Like, okay, so in RIS... In case you didn't know, the AI cheats and gets way more money than the player gets. Mm. Um, extreme mode gives you gives the AI even more money than that. Um, so that's what extreme mode does, basically, in a nutshell. Yeah. So basically, anyone that you know is is a veteran player, you know, and and doing very if, well. If RIS is not hard enough for you, try playing RIS on extreme mode, and maybe that's better for you. Yeah. But if it's if it's already very hard, don't click that tick at the start, guys. Don't click that. Maybe not. Uh, but yeah, like we said before as well, there's a lot more money going around. So of course yeah. the AI has more money as well. Uh, what does that mean for the AI then? Does that just mean it builds more armies, that sort of thing, or? So, like I said earlier, uh, kind of making the AI do what you want it to do is pretty hard. Um, but what you can do is basically give the AI tools and tips in the modding of the game files to say, like, hopefully the AI will, will do this because it's kind of been suggested in the game's code as well as they feel that they have the resources to do those things. So giving the AI more money is a way for the AI to feel more comfortable taking risks and mm. being more aggressive. Because if the AI doesn't have enough money it's going to be super passive and not want to take risks because if it loses its army, for example, that's going to be a big blow yeah. to it. So it's a lot more conservative with risk taking. Yeah. So um, I think the AI for 0 0.6 is going to be a little bit more fun to play against mm. um, and a little bit more challenging, but you can't expect miracles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think... Um... 
like you're saying, it's going to make it a little bit more aggressive. And I think that's definitely um, a good thing, uh, making it more aggressive, having more units. But I just want a quick little detail question on that. So, you know, of course, the AI has bonuses to its money, but does it still take the AI two turns to recruit everything as well? So they're not just, you know, drawing yeah. armies out of nowhere. Every, every unit takes two turns to recruit, except for agents. Agents take one. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good to know. And of course, there are, are there still the scripted armies for a few nations when they get down to like the last couple of settlements? Um, uh, yeah, scripted armies are still a thing. Yeah, guys. So if you, you know, if you're playing and you notice that an army's kind of come out of nowhere, it's likely because you've got that nation down to the last couple of settlements. Um, because it, otherwise, the AI. The way of doing the, the, the AI faction one last chance to do something and hopefully not die yeah. and if they do die well good job you killed them or yeah. they just die yeah um and in I think fact, there's a funny anecdote um to that i had um i want to say this was when we were doing 0 0.5 it was before 0 plus i'm not sure though um but i was doing some campaign testing and i had um i had done some some i hadn't created the scripts for the um, emergency army for Macedon, yeah. but I had adjusted it slightly, and I was testing it to see how it worked. Mm. And basically, what happened is um, I had beat Macedon down to its last few cities and was pushing them, and then they spawned their scripted army. But instead of attacking me and defending their last city, they just <laughs> went away to go attack a random rebel city, and then lost the battle to attack attacking the rebels and <laughs> in that army their last general was in it so they just got deleted from the map because their their army died and i didn't even have to <laughs> siege their last city um nice. so these these scripted armies like i said like it's there so that hopefully they do something but the ai is gonna ai and AI sometimes they just bro. make a bad choice and there's not much we can do about it yeah Dude, AI gonna AI, dude. Exactly. AI gonna AI. Yeah. Um, so, um, let's talk a little bit about reforms then. Um, so, what have you changed with the reforms? I'm assuming just added in more reforms for every faction, I guess? Or at least all the factions that have been remastered? Units, um, there are a couple of factions that get reform units. Um, the most prevalent reform unit is probably going to be the Aspidophoroi, mm. which is a heavy cavalry unit that Greek factions get. Depending on which faction it is, it'll be slightly different. Some Aspidophori have a shield and javelins and a spear. Some have shield, sword, and javelins. And then some have like a special kind of shield yeah. and javelins and a spear. The Aspidophoroi is a cursed unit on, in RIS, to be honest, because <laughs> there's been a whole lot of uh, stuff to do with them in the past. Um, if you're if you're on the RIS team, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, that's one example. And Aspidophoroi units, I think just about not all Greek factions, but most Greek factions have an Aspidophoroi. Um, and then there's um, some units, or sorry, some factions get, like, Thurioforoi as a reform and don't get it at the start. Thurioforoi is that spear unit that has, um, the big or oval-shaped Thurio shield and some yeah. light armor, a spear and javelins. Um, so, some factions just have those right off the bat. Some factions, you need to unlock it with a reform. Um, and reform should be cleaned up and should... Like, the trigger should be working cleanly and correctly. So, uh, they should be in good shape. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, a bit more reforms out there as well, which is great. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about factions-wise, then. Uh, obviously, guys, you know, you can check out a lot of this information on previous videos as well if you want deep dives on this. This is more a, a sort of holistic view, an overall view of all the gameplay changes in one uh, but if you want deeper information on every on on you know all these little bits that we talk about 
uh, do check out. So if if you want to talk about the uh, Spido Foroi, uh, we've got the Greek AOR one. If you want to talk about reforms, that video will come up soon. Uh, and if you want to talk about new factions, look at the Thracian and the Greek interview I did with Mausolos, where we talk about all these new factions. But in those videos, we talked about emergent factions a little bit, Mosca, didn't we? So um, what is the difference there with emergent factions now? Obviously, there's a few emergent factions, um, but I'm guessing you've just set certain parameters up for those guys to spawn in. Um... Yeah, so I think in 0 0.5, the only emergent faction is the Greek city-states, hmm. which would spawn if a Greek faction, or sorry, if a Greek city uh, revolted against whoever owned it, yeah. they would spawn. Now the Greek city-states is an existing faction at the start of the campaign, which I'm not going to go into detail on that because you can watch the interview with Maslow's to kind of get an idea for what they are and how they work. But basically, there are also fact factions on the map that are they don't start there at the start of the campaign but if the city that they they are based out of revolts from their owner faction they'll appear um one example there's a couple examples i can tell you um Paros or tarentum will appear if tarentum revolts from the romans or if it just yeah. revolts in general Paros will appear Another one is Miletos, which I believe begins as a city under the Egyptians. And if they revolt, Miletos will appear. And Miletos is a really important and significant city in yeah. ancient times. So um, if you watch the interview with Mazlos, you'll be able to learn all about them. And the really interesting Milesian tales, which are really good literature that I recommend everybody <laughs> read. <laughs> Have you ever read um, a Milesian tale? <laughs> yeah, it's it's my favorite book. Your favorite book. <laughs> oh yeah, check that video out to know why I'm laughing, guys. <laughs> or put or look in the comments. I'm sure someone's commented it. Um, but yeah, cool. Uh, that that sounds good. Uh, but there is one big emergent faction that I was hoping we're in the battle now. <laughs> And uh, I did put the Egyptians in this battle, guys. But I think they spent themselves pretty early on. So I don't believe there's any Egyptians left. Oh, yeah, there's one. There's a singular Egyptian of two. Two Machimoy. Two Machimoy uh, Epilectoi Phalangites running off the battlefield. That is the last remaining Egyptians on this battlefield. Um, but yeah, the Egyptian revolt. That's quite a big event that's going to happen now, isn't it? So uh, do you mind uh, talking about that for a second? About you know, why that's been added in and also, you know, what it what it entails. Uh, so basically, in RIS, um, you have two Egyptian factions. You have the Ptolemaic Empire, the Ptolemaic Kingdom, which is the Greek uh, successors of Alexander that basically set up a Greek aristocracy in Egypt mm. and controlled it. Um, and then you have Egypt, which is basically native Egyptians who, um, at the start of the campaign, Egypt is completely owned by the Ptolemaic dynasty. But yeah. if, if something happens, which I don't want to give it away exactly because we <laughs> want it to be a bit of a surprise. Yeah. But if certain conditions are met, the Egyptians are going to rebel mm. and... Egypt is going to rebel from the Ptolemaic dynasty, and this is based on a real historical war that took place between the, the native Egyptians and the Ptolemaic dynasty, where basically it was a big deal, and yeah. it was a giant war, and in the end, like the the Ptolemaic dynasty did win, but it was it was it it kind of weakened them, and it um. It was just a really bloody war, and yeah. we wanted to simulate that in RIS because it's relevant and it also helps add a little bit of extra uniqueness to um, yeah. to the map and to the the campaign situation. And a bit of an extra challenge for the Ptolemies as well because they are a yeah. very strong nation at the start of the game. Yeah, they're they're definitely one of the easiest factions you can play in RIS at the moment, which is good for beginners. But this big revolt is going to throw a little bit of a uh, 
curveball at you when you're playing, playing <laughs> yeah exactly that's cool um yeah yeah no i do really like the uh, egyptian revolt idea we talked about it a little bit in the greek aor one but not too much i don't think um but yeah, it is really cool. Um, and as you can see, as you've seen earlier on, guys, there are Egypt, there is an Egyptian roster as well, um, which you can see, which I have done a video on as well. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, watch uh, that video. Yeah, exactly. Or uh, Mosca will troll you on the Discord if you don't. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, do really like the Egyptian one. Uh, let's just talk about the emergent factions for a second then. Can you play... Obviously, we know the unplayable factions, those Greek factions are a bit unplayable, a lot of them. Uh, but these emergent factions like Egypt, like the Egyptians, can you play as them and on the game as well? So, I think for the Egyptians specifically, if you're playing as Ptolemaic Dynasty and the Egyptians rebel, you'll get a little box that says, Hey, the Egyptians have revolted. Do you want to play as the Ptolemaic Dynasty and crush the revolt? Or do you want to play as the Egyptians and get, you know, a new free Egyptian uh, country yeah. to play as? Um, and, like, you know, lead lead the rebellion. Um, and then also, when new factions that are emergent factions revolt, I'm not sure how exactly it's going to trigger. I don't know, like, for example, if you're playing as Rome and Taras revolt, I don't know if, like... You just you just get the option to say, hey, I want to play as Taurus now, yeah. or it doesn't matter who you're playing as. You can just choose to to play as them. Like you know what I mean. Like if you're playing yeah, as yeah. Carthage, or I don't know, if you're playing as uh, the Seleucid Empire and Taurus revolted, would you get to play as? Um, would you get the option to play as them? I'm not sure, but there will be there will be a way to play as the emergent factions. Yeah, and. Yeah. You can also use console commands to just change the faction you're playing to another one as well, which yeah. is something that I like to do a lot when I'm testing. Yeah, of course, so. yeah. No, sounds good, sounds good. I think a lot of people will be wanting to play as, like, Tarentum or the Lysiads yeah. um, or something like that, or Militos as well, uh, especially Mausolos. Um, but, yeah, no, I think it'll be uh, really cool. Uh, with those guys added in. So, guys, that brings us to the end. And, of course, thank you very much, Mosca, for joining me. Always a pleasure to have you here, bro. Yeah, thanks for having me. And, guys, make sure you do like and subscribe the video because, as we've said before, Mr. Cherry gets very upset when you don't like and subscribe the video. And he goes around, he talks to a lot of chairs. So, you might be sorry if you don't like and subscribe. But, anyway, guys... <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. It's been a pleasure. As always, check out all those videos we've mentioned down in the description. And I will see you all again on the next video.